Matthew Jonathan Weaver Jr., 5 foot 10, has a slender build. He's about 130 to 140 pounds with a tattoo above his heart on his chest, which says Jeremiah, his late uncle's name. He is a kind and thoughtful young man with a deep love for dogs and his family. And he's been missing since 2018. Matthew was just barely getting his feet wet into adulthood at 21 when he mysteriously and tragically goes missing in Simi Valley on August 10th, 2018. To this day, Matthew's case remains an open and unsolved missing persons case. We want to continue the incredible efforts of To Live and Die in LA, the Curious Case of Matthew Weaver podcast, which originally covered Matthew's disappearance. The more eyes, ears, and hearts focused on this story, the better. So pay attention because you never know. You may be the one who can help Matthew's family find him and bring him home. This is True Crime and Headlines with Jules and Joe, and I'm Jules. And I'm Joe, and we're your new True Crime besties. Our goal is to honor all of the victims of the true crime stories we tell, um, to bring awareness to ongoing cases, and just allow people's stories to be told. We will have all of our sources and links for further reading and or research on our website, truecrimeandheadlines.com, under episode notes. And you can help us to continue doing what we're doing um, by contributing to our podcast fund on our website. Every dollar helps us keep moving forward and bringing stories to you. You may also help us grow by giving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. You know, Julie and I are based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and it has been an incredible difficult week for our city with the Covenant School shooting. We just wanted to take a moment to honor the victims of the shooting by reading their names. Evelyn Deakhouse, Mike Hill, Catherine Koontz, Cynthia Peake, Hallie Scruggs, William Kinney. Yeah, our hearts, our hearts are heavy with you, families that are going through that, and everyone who is impacted. You know, Joe and I are moms, and. These hit even harder, I think, after we became parents. Um, and I'm a, a former school teacher, and Joe is a is a mental health provider. So, on many levels, um, and being connected in some way or another uh, through varying degrees with the families that were going through this, um, we just want everyone listening to know that it is important to know the victims' names, and um, we encourage you guys to do what you can to give back to them, whether it's through GoFundMe support. We'll add links on our website, True Crime and Headlines, for you guys to do so. Thank you. Okay. All right. Audio Steve is with us, and it's time to share Matthew's story. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. He's out of control. Who gave the man a button board? (laughs) Mercy. (laughs) All right. So a few years ago, when I first listened to Matthew's story by reporter and host Neil Strauss, it felt very personal to me for some reason, and I couldn't quite pinpoint why, but upon reflecting, I think it may have to do with being a mom of boys myself and having spent a lot of time in college in the same Los Angeles mountains, uh, which Matthew went missing in. And whatever reason, I found myself going back to this case periodically over the years to check in, and each update is the same. There is no update. So Neil Strauss shared a link of hundreds of aerial photos of the area where Matthew went missing for listeners to sift through and analyze, which I will also link in our show notes. And I recall sitting in a dark room one night, spending hours (laughs) into the evening, going through the photos and writing down anything I thought I may need to go back and look over. And Joe, you know me well, you know, I really sat and I, (laughs) I was zooming in and pinpointing. I really wanted to be somebody who could find something to help because it just spoke to me so much and it was so heavy. And I thought, oh gosh, they, 
they uploaded all these photos. I can take a second and look, look through them. So that's one thing that has stayed with me throughout all these years. And then I joined their Facebook page, Help Find Matthew Weaver. And that is where I see the updates continuously, that there are no updates and he is still missing. And as I go into more specifics about this case, it's going to blow your mind why, and hopefully it'll piss you off that there are no more updates. And this is why, you know, we've decided to reshare the story. You know, we're a new podcast. Perhaps we can get some new ears in this case and encourage people to help in the efforts to find Matthew. And we so often feel, you know, detached from the stories of true crime, yet there are numerous accounts and situations where the public actually helps solve the case, especially now with all the technology that we have and the quick communication. So like, for instance, the more recent and tragic story of Gabby Petito, young girl who went missing and a YouTube vlogger spotted her van in some of the video footage that they took. And it was, it ended up confirming one of Gabby's last known whereabouts. Okay. So I implore you to go beyond this podcast when it's done, go log onto our website and look at our episode notes. And we will have the link that to live and die in LA podcast on Matthew Weaver did, uh, all the articles to read and the numbers to call if you have any information, which may help this case. Before we continue, I do want to make one thing clear. So no matter the cause of the disappearance, Matthew's family deserves to have his disappearance treated just as seriously and equally as any others. There are many different rumors about what may have happened to him, but I am going to be very blunt here. You cannot mourn a rumor. (laughs) Closure is never promised, but progress can be made in rebuilding a life when a door is closed And Matthew's family has had some infuriating roadblocks along their travels to justice. And we will dive into some of these in a bit, but I think we need to get to know Matthew a little bit more before we do. Okay, let's hear it. All right, Joe. Matthew Weaver spent a majority of his childhood being passed around to different family members to care for him. So his father, Matthew Sr., who deeply loves his son, was a very young father, and he actually found himself alone with a young baby because Matthew's biological mom left when he was just four months old. Okay, so we've got some early attachment. Can that develop in an infant and then manifest later in life, even without? And how does that manifest? Yeah, attachment begins in utero, actually. So if we have a mom who there's a lot of chaos during pregnancy, we don't want the pregnancy there's drug use, whatever, the many different circumstances, right? That's when attachment is starting to form. And so in those early, early stages, if it's not there, um, there can be a lot of difficulty with like intimacy versus isolation, trust versus mistrust, all the different developmental stages moving forward because those developmental needs were not met early on and they don't just go away. Um, They become problematic and sometimes people look for other ways to, to kind of meet those needs. We often think there's a big misconception that like, oh, anything before like 12 months or three years or whatever, the kids won't remember and it won't impact their life. That could not be more false. Even if we um, adopt a day of birth, sometimes there are some attachment struggles that um, the kids deal with later on. Do you think that people misunderstand the difference between remember and affecting, because like, you don't remember it, but it can still affect oh, yeah. you. Yeah. Anytime that there's any sort of trauma, whether it's attachment or physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, before the child is verbal, so generally around age three, there's not words for it, right? There's not a way for them to verbally express it, but it's stored in their bodies. Um, and so their their body remembers it, right? So I don't, I don't know, obviously, anything else about Matthew at this point, but knowing that mom was absent at four months old, uh, really would suggest that there could possibly be some upcoming attachment struggles. Matthew Sr. tells Investigation Discovery that Matthew did have abandonment issues stemming from this event. And it sounds like that, you know, Matthew Sr., his his father was doing the best that he could and being a young father. And I can't imagine, you know, he was also left. Do we know how young dad was? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Yeah. Matthew settled into more stability when his father married his stepmother, whom he would go on to have a very close relationship with. And her name is Brooke. And it's very obvious when you hear Brooke talk about 
Matthew, it's really obvious how much that she loves and cares for him. And to live and die in LA, Curious Case of Matthew Weaver, the podcast, you hear her recall how Matthew was such a loving and kind child who really wanted to belong. Do you know how old he was when Brooke came in his life? I am not sure about that one. One of the best. I want to say six, but I don't want to. I don't want to miss misinform everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, One of the best things for insecure attachment is someone that is consistent um, and you know, has un- unconditional love, delights in the child, and is just always there, consistent. So the kind of word that keeps coming up. So she likely changed his life. So, you know, he did go on to have a younger brother and sister, and he absolutely loved them, and they were all very close. And his father and stepmother would later go on and divorce, and that reportedly had a really big impact on Matthew. And he remained a constant dog lover throughout all of it. And so, you know, we love him. <laughs> We're dog people. Um, and he was actually known for rescuing them. Do we know how old he was when they divorced? <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Hold on. G- give me the give me the web browser. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. I didn't know how old he was when she came in his life and how old he was when Hold they on, got let me take a swig of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Get out, audience team. You're Spirit failing. fingers back here. You're failing me. Okay, sorry, you can I didn't think you know the answer to that, so you can erase that part. I know you're just <laughs> pushing my butt. And he remains close with Brooke and his siblings throughout this time. And at some point Matthew does go to live with his grandmother. And shortly before he goes missing around 20 or 21, he moves into his own apartment. And Matthew's father recalls to investigation discovery that Matthew wanted to try to branch out on his own. So moving into the Granada Hills apartment was his way of doing so. However, according to Matthew's ex-girlfriend, a girl named Vanessa, she saw evidence of an abundance of excessive alcohol consumption during this transition So he had hard liquor bottles everywhere, and she recalls that there were empty liquor bottles next to full liquor bottles that were ready on deck to be consumed. And Matthew was also experimenting with hard drugs. Do we know what kind of drugs? They go on to talk later about acid. Okay. Um, His friends uh, talk about that, and I think they go on to talk about uh, something else, too. I believe it's cocaine. Okay. A lot of times... Obviously, substances can be used um, to kind of self-medicate these really difficult feelings that we're sitting with, like abandonment, loss, grief, negative core beliefs, whatever it may be. I would say alcohol, most notably, um, really kind of numbs that out. And so it sounds like it's really still kind of fitting the picture of that early trauma. Now, what if I told you that when I said ex-girlfriend, Vanessa, that was a recent thing as well? Oh, would that play into somebody who has abandonment issues? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, it can play out in many different ways. Um, sometimes we become overattached to romantic partners when we haven't kind of mastered our attachment style with caregivers or can be avoidant or we can kind of do this push and pull sort of dance with them that can be very confusing for the other partner. But absolutely, attachment styles with caregivers play out in romantic relationships as well. Yeah, they were together like for many years, ever since they were teenagers, but they, you know, would ultimately break up. And Matthew was admittedly really struggling with that. And he was working alongside his father, Matthew Sr., training to be a linesman for a telephone power company. So there was some stability and consistency there that was part of his life with that. And, you know, seeing his father would probably be a Mm -hmm. good influence on that since he's living alone and doing whatever, you know, alone. Did dad mention any of the substance use or alcohol use? Yes. He knew that his son had been struggling. He saw, he saw the shift, how his son was, was changing. So we find ourselves with Matthew on August 9th, 2018. This is just one day before he goes missing and we never hear from him again. The timeline we're going to now share was pieced together by the downloading of Matthew's Snapchat location history. So if you're not familiar with Snapchat, users can turn on location services and share where they are posting from, 
Or if you have the app actively up and running, it can automatically start pinging your location and storing it in your data if you have not turned that off. Turn off. Okay. So August 9th, Matthew wakes up late into the day as he has been partying you know, late the evening prior. And at 6 p.m., Matthew hops in his silver BMW and he then drives to work to pick up his paycheck from his boss. Now, the reports actually just say to pick up $400 cash. And I don't know if that matters. Picking up cash for jobs is not the typical way, but I am curious why it was cash and if that's the normal protocol, but we don't know any more information, but I do have questions. With his cash in hand, he heads over to his father, Matthew Sr.'s home, and it's there that we have data from Matthew's Snapchat because he posts a photo to the app with the words, game over. The photo is actually of a gun. Oh. And apparently it was Matthew Sr.'s gun. So Matthew had actually asked for a gun. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. He knew his son did not need to have a gun. Mm -hmm. So can I just take a picture of it? So over the photo of him holding a gun, it says game over. How would you interpret that? I would interpret that as a suicide notice. Matthew Sr. didn't give him the gun. No, he did not give him the gun. Yeah, I can't make sense of why he would post that if he didn't actually have the gun other than maybe a cry for help and a cry for attention. Here's another view. Mm -hmm. Beef with somebody, game over. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about it outwardly. Like I have the, the upper mm-hmm. hand here or trying to look harder. He had a different group of friends since moving to Granada Hills, his apartment out there. Maybe it was to look harder, look tougher. Um, those are some other theories that were out there. There is a very, very popular one that it was people look at as a suicide notice. Did he have beef with anyone at that time? That is not something that was publicly stated. However, I will share some information later that we will need to circle back and talk about. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, my first my first thought would be a suicide notice. Yeah. So we need to introduce a new person into this timeline. Her name is Melissa Sanchez. So Matthew and Melissa were not known to be close friends, but rather they ran around that same group of friends and had recently begun to spend more time together. Matthew picks Melissa up in his car around 9 p.m. Together, they head over to Walmart. They stop at a gas station to fill up, and then they head down the famed Los Angeles Road, Sepulveda Boulevard, to a non-disclosed location to reportedly purchase cocaine. Okay. Then they head to a marijuana dispensary before returning to Melissa's house in Chatsworth, where, according to Melissa, They sit in his car until about 5 a.m. before she heads inside. The time that they are sitting is open for interpretation. According to Melissa, they were talking. How much time is it? Hours in the car in front of her house after they had picked up cocaine, after they had picked up marijuana. So Melissa shares on the Live and Die in LA podcast that Matthew started getting really emotional while they are in the car and venting and crying to her. And that made Melissa feel really awkward and uncomfortable considering that they were new friends. And she didn't go into the exact words that he was saying. And that's a lot of the curiosity a lot of people have in this case is, what did he say to you? And she won't disclose that? (laughs) It was not disclosed. Just 15 minutes later, and remember, we have his location complements of his Snapchat app tracking his locations. So he exits off the 101 freeway in Los Angeles and gets onto the famed Mulholland Highway through the hills. Now, I will pause, put a pin in this for a second to go ahead and declare that people from California say the 101 (laughs) and everyone else says like Interstate 101 or... I need a microphone. uh, Shush, Dad! We're trying to record a podcast. I I think we bring him in. Bring him in. We'll bring him in for D.B. Cooper. He's old. He'll remember it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Just 15 minutes later. And remember, we have his location history. Compliments of his Snapchat app that is tracking his locations. So he exits off the 101 freeway in Los Angeles and he gets onto the famed Mulholland Highway. 
So if you're not familiar with the geography of Los Angeles, I will just say that he was going from different little towns in Los Angeles area. So Melissa was over in Chatsworth. He has to get on the freeway to go up through Los Angeles into Mulholland Highway. So he leaves more of the town city areas and goes more up into the mountains, Los Angeles mountains. So from 515 to 657 a.m., he continues to drive around the mountainous roads. When he then stops in Topanga Canyon at Stooney Road and Saddle Peak Road. So it's a popular overlook spot where his ex-girlfriend, Vanessa, will later go on to report that Matthew frequented, even taking her there a few times, you know, racing his car through the roads and taking photos. So we have a known location to an emotional and admittingly struggling Matthew. And he sits in the parking lot for about 15 minutes before he proceeds to actually get out of his vehicle and open a big metal gate that was left unlocked and which was closing off access to a fire road. So it's not supposed to be for public transportation. And I actually have gone up into these type of mountains and area when I was in college and we would go into the Los Angeles National Forest. And it's really fun because we would always go. We would go up and you drive through the switchbacks and lots of spots to stop. And we'd even go up there in theater and we would practice our lines on like the edges of cliffs. (laughs) You would practice speaking out into the canyon, all that nerdy theater stuff. Shout out to my thespians up in here. Um, but it's just like, it's a common thing to do. Okay. And go, I even uh, with Amanda, shout out Amanda, we would go and drive through the mountains and have life talks. It just, to me, it makes sense. It's reported that the road is actually asphalt before turning into dirt. And it's said to not be safe for vehicles. So I am guessing it's not a maintained road. Sure. So at some point it stops being a road that we need to have maintained and it goes into just gravel road, you know, emergencies, which are not often maintained very well. It does lead to a split, a kind of like a Y, and the road continues up on one side up to a microwave tower, which was transitioning ownership. So it was under construction. And that means that there's a lot of worker traffic though. And the location was being known and it had a surveillance camera. Did it get in? It caught his car. So the camera does catch Matthew's car driving through the metal gate, but it does not show anyone else driving behind him. And that's important. Okay. So all we see is Matthew going through the gate. Correct. And at the end of the fire road is where Matthew's car is ultimately located without Matthew. With the road getting more narrow as it continues on, any chance of being able to turn a car around is extremely rare. In fact, his car was actually found with one of his tires kind of hovering off the ground and over the ledge of the mountain as if he was trying to reverse his car, but it got stuck and there was no way to move his car again. Sometime between 6.24 a.m. through 6.57 a.m., Matthew posts a sunrise photo to Snapchat with a graphic over the photo, which just says Friday. And at 821, Matthew's father misses a call from him. He didn't have any reception on his phone at the time. And here's what is odd. Over three hours pass before he makes another call. And so at 1148 a.m., Matthew calls Melissa Sanchez. Remember, Melissa and Matthew were together until about 5 a.m. And Melissa says she was at work, so she doesn't answer, but she does text him back. So we do have that text exchange here. So missed call from Matthew. Melissa texts him and says, I'm at work. What's up? Matthew says, like some crazy is on is going on shit going on. I just want to talk while I have the chance. And that ends all communication with Matthew. His phone either dies or it's turned off intentionally, unintentionally, or it's damaged. Whatever the reason, we lose all ways of tracking his phone. It stops pinging right after that. What I'm confused about is, 
So his father, Matthew Sr., does not receive the call from Matthew because Matthew Sr. doesn't have reception. So he misses his son's phone call at 821 a.m. What is going on from 821 a.m. all the way through 1148 a.m.? His car's already stuck. Where, where has he been during that time? And what what's going on? And the fact that he says like some crazy is going on, shit going on. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And so the two things that kind of come to mind to me are substance use, being under the influence of some sort of substance, whether alcohol or cocaine or or the whole gamut. And another kind of thing on my radar is like mania slash hypomania and the possibility of that. Because we know he's been up well past 24 hours now. We can't really truly call it a manic or a hypomanic episode when there's presence of alcohol or drugs. Anytime there's a substance on board, that would be an alcohol or substance drug-induced episode, not just like truly mania or hypomania. But when you're under the, the influence, time goes by fast sometimes, and you're not making sense. You can't make a coherent sentence. I feel like this had a lot to do with the drugs that they picked up earlier that day. And Melissa did text him back an hour later to check in on him, but she did not get any reply. Obviously, his phone was not receiving anything. So going off a of cell phone location data, you know, Matthew did not appear to leave the area from the moment his car was parked at that top of the road to when his phone stopped tracking his location. And we can obviously likely draw the conclusion it's because his phone was off. So now we have lost all ability to track Matthew. So did we ever find his phone? No. Okay. Jaden Brandt, a private investigator hired on this case, tells Investigation Discovery that on August 11th at 1 a.m., California Highway Patrol receives a 911 call from hikers stating they heard yelling and police arrive on the scene within minutes. According to Matthew's stepmother, Brooke, CHP later confirms to also hear yelling that they thought they heard somebody yell, he's got a gun. And this is how Matthew's car was discovered. So near the Rosa's overlook above the Backbone Trail and Hondo Canyon areas, once it was determined that his vehicle was abandoned, it was then that Matthew Jonathan Weaver Jr. became a missing person and remains one to this day. So while they were going out and looking for these said hikers yelling or having some kind of altercation when they were searching for other people is when they found Matthew's car. So it was, was there basically by chance, like they weren't looking for Matthew. We never found the people that said he has a gun. No. And actually they later go on to learn, his family later goes on to learn that there's actually not even a written report about that phone call. Very odd and interesting. And we'll get into that in, in, in just a little bit. So search and rescue arrive with the dogs to search the area, but sadly they don't find Matthew. And a land survey company volunteered to take aerial photos using a drone to capture the area and the surrounding area of where Matthew's car was found. So this is yielding approximately 800 photos. And they were then uploaded to a Dropbox file and shared with the public in hopes to have as many eyes on him, combing through the photos as possible, hoping to find any type of evidence to help them locate Matthew. And one person finds something. And these are the same photos that I sat through in the middle of the night going through. And this one person finds something. So they go ahead and message the Finding Matthew Weaver Jr. Facebook page. And they share that they found a tiny red dot in one photo, which they believed could be Matthew's Angels baseball team hat. Hmm. So his stepmother, Brooke Tipton, heads out there. And sure enough, it's an Angels baseball hat, exactly like the one that Matthew wore. And next to the hat, is a torn up white shirt with on it appears to be dried blood. What happens next is so frustrating and I can't imagine how it has impacted this case's lack of progress, but the white shirt was handed over to the police department, yet the police department came back to the family and saying that because there was no actual evidence of a crime, that the blood on the shirt or alleged blood on the shirt could not be tested. 
What? And then they refused to give it back to the family. The family wanted to privately fund to have it tested, to have the DNA that could. Absolutely. Is it his or is it not? So this is what happens. According to a screenshot of an email exchange that Matthew's family shared on the Help Find Matthew Weaver Jr. Facebook page, this was an exchange between his sister, Matthew's sister, and a detective. So Colleen Weaver Farrell, his sister, says, I wanted to see if there was an update on the white t-shirt I gave you guys and if it has been tested with my or my dad's DNA. Thank you, Colleen. Now, he replies, Good morning, Colleen. Our serology slash DNA unit would not be able to process the property that was found. Baseball cap and the pieces white t-shirt. Due to, at this time, there is no evidence of a crime. However, we are requesting Matthew's complete dental records. I don't understand Maybe not a crime against Matthew, but why can you not test that or give it back so that the family can test it? Well, I think there's two things going on. I think one is there's possession. It's now a property of the police department. Once it enters their evidence system and it's logged, I believe it becomes, yeah, I believe it becomes their property. And so there would be a liability to release that um, and should something come forth. Yeah, it's it's so sad that, that they... They couldn't find any way to go around it and privately fund it because then you also have, they're not going to test it. Obviously, they have to have their protocols in place. And I can understand limited funds, a lot of cases, few detectives, there's a lot going on. But if they can privately fund it, even for a public sector, and they're not letting them do that, they would, that's, I understand why they can't, but I can also see why this family is livid. Oh, that would be so mad. If there's a chance to help find him, because even if if it's not Matthew's blood, could it be somebody else's on there that could lead to what happened to Matthew? This family just has no closure is, is what's happening. And doing what you think is right and giving it to somebody you think can help you, and then they're not giving it back. And then they say, by the way, can we have his dental records? When do you need dental records when you have a body? That is one of the number one ways that you can identify skeletal remains is through dental records. This is a year later. So are you suggesting you think that there may have been a body found, but it was never disclosed? That's one of the theories was uh, the family's wondering as well, is a John Doe somewhere? And now they're going to try to figure out if it was Matthew. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the family member who posted this screenshot to the Facebook page states in their post that they actually gave LAPD the information of Matthew's dentist, as Matthew had actually just completed x-rays for dental work that year, and they gave permission for the police to obtain the same records. And they did this the same time Matthew went missing in 2018, a year prior. That would be really frustrating. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm all fired up. Yeah. Feels like you're not doing anything. Exactly. 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 And if you have any information regarding Matthew's disappearance, please contact Origin Investigations at 800-358-3830 or the Los Angeles Police Department at 877-LAPD-247. So Brooke Tipton reveals during her ID interview that a few of Matthew's friends came to her and let her know a few nights before Matthew went missing that he cracked his head open pretty badly to the point he had blood running out, which leads into one theory that Matthew just didn't know what was going on, or perhaps he was having some type of traumatic brain injury type symptoms. You know, I think it's a deep hope is that Matthew is still out there alive, but he doesn't know who he is. How did he crack his head open? Do you know? No. Man, these are so, there's all these theories, there's but it's a like lot. a sprinkle of information and they're all dead ends. There are a lot of questions and I think it is just full of stones that were not turned over. You know, there are so many theories about what happened to Matthew. So we, we can explore a few of them here. Um, you know, there's the suicide theory. Mm-hmm. 
And Matthew was feeling depressed. He had his breakup from his longtime girlfriend and maybe drugs and alcohol were contributing. And I don't know, like, what impact can those type of drugs have on someone who is feeling depressed already? Well, alcohol is a depressant, right? So it can further exacerbate those feelings or those emotions. What's odd to me is that he posts a photo of the sunrise. And that's just, and from a place that he was known to enjoy to go and, and think about life and and think this place is beautiful. And he shares this beautiful photo of a sunrise. So do we have on Snapchat the photo of the gun that says game over and then next Snapchat post is the sunrise? I don't know if it's the next consecutive one. I don't know if there are a few in between. That's the next one that was shared with us though. That feels a lot more like hopeful, right? It's a new day, but it could also be like, this is, this is it. My, my ending place, one of my favorite places. This is beautiful. I don't know. There's so many questions. This next theory, however, is hard for the family to believe. From all they know of Matthew, this is not the one that makes sense, especially with his hat being found and that white shirt torn up that they found that looked like it had blood on it. And the fact that he was known to go for long drives in the Los Angeles canyons, you know, to clear his head. Um, but that that's that suicide theory is the one that's the hardest for the family to believe because they felt it goes against all that they knew of Matthew. But then again, Matthew had a, an immense shift in his behaviors and his actions and the people he was hanging around. And they admittedly said that as well. And Melissa, the girl he was getting to know and who he was with the evening prior, was cleared by the police. And some people speculated about gang activity. In the To Live and Die podcast, Matthew's friends are asked about gang activity and any relations to gang activity of anybody that was hanging around Matthew, and they refused to answer the question. They said they were not going to go into that. I wonder if they were scared. Yeah. It was reported that when the family and friends attempted to ask questions at the tower— of the men who were working the tower, because remember, it was under construction. Yeah, and that's were there the, any guys there? Yeah, well, it was reported that the family was met with a lot of hostility by the workers. And that could be a number of reasons. I mean, that could not be related to them being guilty of any involvement. Like, they could just be dicks. <laughs> like, we already came. I mean, we were already approached. We already answered questions. Stop begging us. They could just be, like, rotten people, not not their problem. Being a dick doesn't mean you're guilty of, of anything. But what I want to know is how deeply were the people who had access to the tower investigated? Were they looked into? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Could they be any part of it? And I also have questions about the security cameras. They say no one came in after Matthew. Did someone go in before Matthew? And how much time had passed? Because we don't know. It's not on record. I mean, they might know, but it wasn't released. I mean, it's still considered an open case. So there's a lot of things that we don't know. And what hours was that tower manned, right? At what hours were those workers in there? Yeah. I mean, in you know, doing construction work, I would assume it would be construction hours, but I don't want to make assumptions because you, we just don't know how things were operating, you know, sometimes they'll do freeway work in the middle of the night. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, there are a lot of stones, I feel, that were not turned over. And it does not sit right with me. Um, another thing that does not sit right with me is that his stuff was found all spread out. They later wow. found his car keys spread out in different locations around, you know, where his car was, but spread out far enough that... You couldn't just see where they were. And why was his shirt torn up? And why have we not found his body? Or his phone. Yeah. Or him. I don't want to assume. I mean, there's always there always has to be that little chance of hope. And I can't imagine being the family. Uh, I mean, you're not allowed to grieve when you don't know where this person is. Exactly. There's absolutely no closure. And not only that, there's just doors being slammed in their face I mean, 
to not have the DNA tested on a shirt that was next to his hat, which was his hat. I just, I don't understand. Imagine the guilt from dad of not being able to take that call 821 in the morning. Yeah, he doesn't deserve to have that guilt to hold that in. Because, you know, you and I would, if, if we had that, but he, he doesn't deserve to, to hold that, that guilt. There's no telling what, you know, either I'm sure he plays scenarios in his head, but it's just a sad, sad situation all the way through. I mean, I feel unsettled. Yeah. I have a million questions and I, it's the first time I've heard this story. So I can't imagine living this and this being your reality. I mean, we have his hat, his car, his car key, an untested white shirt with blood on it. And still, it's not enough to consider that a crime occurred. He's missing under suspicious circumstances. Why can we not find a way to test his DNA? There's got to be something in there. And the fact that they asked a year later for his dental records. In which they've already been turned over. Yeah, that to me, it um, from the little information we have, I would not be pleased with the way that the case was being handled. There are numerous missing persons cases that are open in the Los Angeles area. I am sure they are completely overworked, underpaid, understaffed. However, for that one person that has someone missing, those those are not excuses. You have got to treat each case with that respect and, and the communication. I just... If I read that email that said, oh, can we get the dental records? I would have gone nuclear. Yeah. I would have lost faith. Yeah. I think, I don't know how I wouldn't be down there in that office every day, banging down doors. How much can the police department financially do? How much more can they do? How much more can they justify within their budget to doing for a missing person case, what needs to be done to be considered a crime? People get charged for committing murder and there is still no body found. So So, how can somebody be missing and it's still not under suspicious circumstances? I wonder if he's being written off as somebody who went up there to kill himself. Mm -hmm. Because that would align and make sense with a lack of things that have it still doesn't make sense if he went up there to kill himself, why we can't find a body. Joe, what are your thoughts? We have these little slivers of information peppered in. I know you don't have much to work with because you don't have Matthew in front of you to talk to him. We don't have everyone else to talk to in front of us. But is there enough doubt for you to, is there enough in there for you to doubt suicide? One of the biggest theories. No, I don't doubt it. Like you said, there's more questions than answers. And so it's hard for me to make an absolute theory. Um, I would say substance use had probably a part in it, um, given his text. There could have been a bipolar episode, which would make sense with Melissa saying that he wasn't really making sense. He was up multiple days, it sounds like, which again, could have been substance induced. Again, the The Watchtower guys also are a question in my mind, too. Um, But I don't think suicide should be ruled out. Something in me just says it's not suicide. I just, there's so many questions. I just, I maybe it's, I just lean towards, unless it's obvious, and maybe I'm a skeptic, I think there's something shady. (laughs) Something, I feel like there was something Shady. And the main reason I can't shake that theory is because of the text that he sent to Melissa. There's something crazy going on. And then also hearing he's got a gun. And then we find his hat in one spot, his keys in another spot. Yeah. What is going on? But if there's like a hypomanic or a manic episode, whether substance induced or not, I wish we had more information on his history, uh, mental health history. There can be delusions. There can be audiovisual hallucinations. There can be a lot of paranoia. Mm. And so just kind of like mass chaos. Yeah. So the the texts that are difficult to read because they don't really make sense. And then 
Melissa's comments and, and maybe it's that the conversations they had in that car, she can't put words to them because they didn't make sense because somebody that's hypomanic or manic often aren't making sense, right? They're delusional. They're paranoid. They're just very difficult. to. They're pressured speech. They're very difficult to follow. Hard to say. And, mm-hmm. and even if, okay, so let's say it was suicide. Let's say it wasn't suicide. Either side, it could have been foul play or w- what if it was natural elements, you know? Yeah, what time the, of year was this? Do we know? Uh, this is August. August, that's right. Yeah. In California, too. So it's not like crazy, yeah, crazy hot. But no matter what, this case, I feel, was not being pursued in the way that it oh, is. Absolutely. It deserves to be pursued. And I think about the Watchtower guys, too, right? So if they come to work in the morning and they have this guy that's on substances or is hypomanic or manic and not making sense and delusional and paranoid and erratic, but they may have taken things into their own hands or things may have gotten out of control and they want to cover for themselves despite they're part of it or not part of it. There's so many things that could come into play. If you have any information regarding the Matthew Weaver case, please call one 800 358 38 And again, on our website, we will have sources and notes as well as his missing poster. Um, And we'll link the To Live and Die in LA, the Curious Case of Matthew Weaver podcast on our site as well. Bring him home. Bring peace to Matthew's family. To Matthew's family, we're so sorry that this is what you're going through, that this is your reality. We really feel for you guys. And we pray that there's a resolution This has been True Crime and Headlines with Jules and Joe. I'm Joe. And I'm Jules. And it's a production of the woman-owned Ann Lee Audio House, LLC. We would appreciate a five-star review to help our podcast grow and to be seen. And of course, please subscribe so you get notified every other week when we post a new story. See you next time. Ann Lee Audio House, LLC. My mama is a podcaster. Bye, too.